Hello, my name is Aditya Sharma. I'm an interventional cardiologist with Wellspan Health, here today to talk about peripheral arterial disease. I wanted to take a moment to thank the organization, as well as the Miller G. Deal Cardiovascular Lectureship Endowment for making this a possibility today. Normally, as you may remember, this format is in person. However, given the pandemic, we'll be online this year. I'm hopeful though next year, things will change. This is an important topic uh, that affects millions across the world, in America, in our state, as well as our community. I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. The objectives of today's talk are simple. We're gonna talk about what peripheral arterial disease is, where it is present in the population and trends involving this. We're gonna appreciate the different risk factors that lead to this condition, recognize signs and symptoms of folks that may be suffering from this condition, as well as review outcomes data to where we are with this condition and you know harmful trends that we've been noticing. We will then shift our focus to understanding diagnostic testing in folks that have suspect, suspected peripheral arterial disease. And this will go into some detail for the healthcare professionals watching as well. And for those at home, we will summarize it and make it simple to understand. And then we'll also talk about treatment options and strategies promoting uh, prevention of this condition. I like to start off with this pictorial that shows us what the peripheral arterial system looks like. So you may know about coronary artery disease, and that is the arteries that supply the heart specifically. And the peripheral arterial system in, in a simple sense is all the other arterial vasculature in the body. So this is a picture of the heart here and a large vessel called the aorta that pumps oxygenated, that takes the oxygenated blood pumped from the heart all across the body from the tip of your head to the tip of your toes. For the purposes of our conversation today, we'll refer to this as the peripheral arterial system and talk about that in detail. We'll also specifically focus on the lower extremities uh, and the arterial system supplying that. In the simplest sense, peripheral arterial disease is the narrowing of the arteries that supply blood all over the body, whether it be to the head, the arms, the legs, or organs such as the stomach. And once you have this narrowing of arteries, at some point, there's decreased blood flow supplied to these areas. And that's going to be important when we talk about signs and symptoms, as decrease in blood flow to the arms will manifest differently for signs and symptoms to the leg, stomach, etc. The main process that contributes to this peripheral arterial disease and the narrowing is referred to as atherosclerosis. Many of us may be familiar with this process as it also is the leading cause of coronary artery disease, which we mentioned. And you may say, well, why is that the case? To no surprise, the arterial disease that occurs throughout the body does not always just limit itself to one vascular bed and can involve many of them. And uh, we can kind of go through why here as well. So atherosclerosis is when there's deposition of fatty substances, particularly cholesterol, cellular debris, and waste products, calcium, and other things in the internal lining of the arteries. It is the most common cause of impaired blood flow in the body. And it can start as early as childhood as fatty streaks, which then progress to form plaques, um, and then there's subsequent thickening and narrowing and then decreased blood flow to the organs that are supplied by these arteries and other tissues as well. There are other causes that can restrict blood flow in the peripheral arterial system. And these include blood clots that may form in the vas vasculature with ruptured plaque, which we'll talk about, or they may be blood clots that embolize from other areas of the heart or other areas of the body, uh, into, which includes the heart into uh, the vasculature. You can have inflammation and vasculitis is com the common term for inflammation of the actual blood vessels. 
you can have trauma or injury to that segment. In some cases, you can also have genetic uh, predisposition for this and genetic causes. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I like to show this picture here, uh, which shows uh, a basic cross section of an artery and the process of atherosclerosis. As you can see in the inner lining of the artery, you will have this plaque that collects under the intima or under this intimal lining, the endothelium. It progresses to where two things happen. It progresses to the point where there's narrowing, uh, affecting blood flow, possible occlusion, but you can also have rupture. And when you have rupture, that leads to the body forming a blood clot in that area, further compromising blood flow. So who is predisposed to develop atherosclerosis particularly? It's folks that have the following risk factors high bad cholesterol, which is, is the LDL, low levels of good cholesterol, which is HDL, elevated blood pressure, diabetes, family history for premature arterial disease, things we inflict on ourselves, such as cigarette smoking and tobacco use, obesity, physical inactivity. The older we get, the more our risk goes up conditions that lead to increases of inflammation throughout the body. So as you can imagine, those are pretty common things and therefore this is a pretty common disease process. More than 200 million people worldwide are estimated to have this and some say that is uh, underestimated. And the concerning thing and part of the reason why we're talking about this is despite our uh, understanding of this and various risk factor methods to control these risk factors, these numbers are sadly increasing. 8 million Americans uh, are suspected to have this, which again is an underestimated number. And 4 million of them actually have real symptoms associated with this. The folks that are commonly comprised in this population are smokers, older diabetics, uh, um, and folks that are above the age of 70 with risk factors. So going back to our simple definition um, of the peripheral arterial system, as you can imagine, depending on which vascular bed is involved, that's how our symptoms manifest. So if it involves the lower extremities and depending on different le levels uh, of involvement, you can have exertional cramping of the hips, the thighs, the calf muscles uh, that occur, as mentioned, after exertion, such as walking, climbing stairs. When it involves the upper extremities, you can have aching and cramping with movements, uh, such as knitting, writing, and doing other tasks. After eating a large meal, and the, as the digestive process goes on, you may have stomach pain over time. Going back to the lower extremities, there can be numbness and weakness. There can be asymmetric temperature changes. And as disease progresses, sores that are non-healing. You can also have a change in color, uh, hair loss and decreased hair growth, slower growth of your toenails, skin changes, and loss of pulse when those vessels are get occluded. Men can also experience erectile dysfunction as a result of peripheral arterial disease. A term I want everyone to be familiar with, with this for this conversation as it, it uh, will change our diagnosis strategy as well as our treatment strategy is the term critical limb ischemia. And in essence, this is severe disease that leads to pain even at rest and end organ damage, which includes tissue loss, which can be in the form of non-healing ulcers or even gangrene in the affected segments. One of the slides that personally has touched me throughout my career, uh, I'm going to be sharing it with you right now, just because it really shows the effects and the negative outcomes of folks that, that folks can have with peripheral arterial disease if we do not do anything about it. So initially presenting, 
there's different spectrums. The folks that are asymptomatic, right? That eventually if we do nothing, progress. And then the folks that have critical limb ischemia, again, it's the folks with severe disease that end, have end organ damage. So going on to the extreme spectrum of critical limb ischemia, just in one year after the diagnosis of that, folks can, only 50% of folks will be alive with two limbs. That's a very alarming fact. 25% of them have an amputation, 25% uh, suffer cardiovascular mortality. Again, atherosclerosis affects various vascular beds and that can, contributes to that. After this, um, so now going into the other spectrum of folks that are symptomatic and the folks that have progressive disease, after five years, when it involves their limb, a higher percentage will be symptomatic. That's 70 to 80 percent. 10 to 20 percent will have worse thing, uh, symptoms than when they initially presented. And 1 to 2 percent will unfortunately develop critical limb ischemia as we dis with its sequelae as described above. In terms of cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, 20 percent of folks will have a non-fatal cardiovascular event, which includes a heart attack or a stroke and up to 30% of folks die. Um, and that's alarming. 75% of those from vas cardiovascular causes and 25% from non-cardiovascular causes. So this really shows the impact and the burden that disease uh, can have on folks. So now that we, uh, we've talked about things that can cause folks that are predisposed for peripheral arterial disease, and um, the potential signs and symptoms, we talk about testing. And this is really done based on the signs and symptoms we talked about, physical exam findings that may be present, the risk factors that may be present, and other you know, pathology that if someone had trauma or suspected embolism to that area. Not only to diagnose it, but we use it to confirm the diagnosis and define it. So what vascular bed is involved and what extent is that vascular bed involved? We also use it as surveillance as someone has had an intervention and in the future uh, to follow up those patients. And in, in certain instances of chronic limb ischemia or critical limb ischemia, we will determine wound healing potential. And this is usually done as a team approach as we'll talk about. There's two types of testing. One is physiologic testing and there's anatomic testing. So we'll de delve into detail regarding the physiologic testing today. And this is geared more towards the healthcare professionals. From the patient perspective, I, you know, I want the patients listening here or the community members that are listening that are suspecting that they may have this to kind of get an understanding of what they may expect if their doctor says, hey, we suspect peripher peripheral arterial disease and these are the tests we have to do. And I'll, I'll try to simplify it as best as I can. So again, the physiologic testing is the how. So how does the blood flow, how do blockages affect the blood flow? And then there's anatomic testing, which actually visualizes these vessels. And that includes the common things that we know, which are CTs, MRIs, et cetera. So the physiologic testing that we'll touch upon and go into detail about are the ankle brachial index, which is probably one of the most common used, toe brachial indexes, toe brachial index as well segmental limb pressure, pressures, briefly talk about exercise testing and some of the other methods listed here. Again, this is just to kind of get a, a deeper understanding of these tests. When someone has an abnormal physiologic test or they have evidence of critical limb ischemia, we jump to anatomic testing in conjunction with that, which includes the ultrasounds, which visualize the arteries. CT angiograms, magnetic uh, MRAs or uh, magnetic resonance angiograms, as well as invasive angiograms, which can be which can directly visualize uh, those the vasculature. Starting off, the an ankle brachial index is a great, inexpensive, non-invasive test that can confirm the clinical suspicion of lower extremity arterial uh, occlusive arterial disease. It can also help us measure the severity, which we'll talk about. And as, as everything, it, you know, we, we put this in context with the patient's symptoms. 
very simple test involves a blood pressure cuff and a Doppler. So we use the resting systolic blood pressure from the upper extremities as well as the ankles. And in the upper extremity, we take it, and it's a ratio between both of them. So in the lower extremity, the Doppler signal is, and blood pressure cuff measurements are used for the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial arty, arteries. And then the higher value of those is used in conjunction with the higher value of the, the upper extremity brachial arterial pressures to give us a ratio. There are three tertiles that the values are, are divided into. And this is more for details for the medical professionals. And for the rest of us, I will also uh, generally summarize it. Um, so it's values above 1.4 values between 0.9 and 1.3, and then values below 0.9. So normal is values between 0.9 and 1.3. And this is usually the case, but there are some, some conditions that can throw our results off and create false negatives. And that's when we have extensive mild disease or arterial entrapment syndromes. And like anything in medicine, we know that if we're suspicious about it, we do not give up. We keep making sure that we, we're based on our suspicion, will test to, to kind of unmask the disease if we, um, if we are suspicious of it. And so if someone has symptoms that are strongly suggesting peripheral arterial disease and they have normal values, we may perform other testing at that time, which we'll get into. The highest tertile is the ABI of 1.4. And this occurs in folks that have very calcified vessels that cannot be compressed. And so they have ele elevated uh, falsely elevated pressure measurements. These folks, unfortunately, also have hardier, higher cardiovascular risk because of this calcification. When this is the case, additional testing with uh, duplex studies or toe brachial indexes is performed, again, based on suspicion. And now in the folks with a value below 0.9, that is very specific for occlusive arterial disease in the lower extremities and it's very sensitive for detecting disease as well. When it drops below 0.4, we really get concerned about multivessel disease and the presence of critical limb ischemia, which includes non-healing ulcers, the rest pain we talked about, or even gangrene. So that's, as mentioned, if, if folks have very calcific vessels, particularly diabetics, we use something called the toe brachial index in addition to the ankle brachial index, which it, you know uses the pneumatic cuff over the great toe. And the reason this works is the small vessels of the toes are spared from the calcification process um, as compared to the other larger vasculature. And this is also used, and again, just in some, some uh, details, this is used um, in those conditions uh, where we do suspect it and we are looking for perfusion to the toes, particular to the feet. Uh, this is used in conjunction with other arterial waveforms. And the reason um, that the, the normal value, as you can see there, it says 0.7 to 0.8 is different than it is with the uh, ABI that we just went over is because there naturally there is a pressure gradient that occurs between the ankles and the toes. The toe brachial index test also uh, has a role in, to assess healing in patients with critical limb ischemia. So to summarize, the, rest, uh, the resting ABI with or without segmental waveforms is recommended to establish a diagnosis. I will go into uh, the segmental pressures and how they are measured momentarily. The, uh, the ABIs are divided into three different categories, 0 0.9 to 1.3, above 1.4 and below 0.9, and each with its own um, uh, rationale and uh, implications as discussed. The TBI or the toe brachial index is helpful uh, in that category where it's greater than 1.4 and also in wound healing for, for some of the folks. Again, Whenever we have a suspicion, we don't just rely on these tests. We may have to proceed with other testing, which includes exercise testing or even anatomic testing in those situations. So what are extremity segmental uh, pressures? 
So this is using the ABI with on various levels of the lower extremity to not only diagnose the extent of disease, but also to localize disease. And so for, our, uh, so for folks watching uh, this, this is what this usually looks like. And those are simply blood pressure cuffs placed at different levels. And what are those levels, you may ask? Well, they involve the different levels of vasculature in the lower extremity. That includes the iliac artery uh, here, progressing to the common femoral, which then splits to involve the superficial femoral artery, the popliteal artery, and then uh, trifurcates uh, below the knee to the posterior tibial, perineal, and anterior tibial arteries. So essentially the blood pressure cuffs are placed at different levels corresponding with this to try to localize the disease and also to see the extent of what it may be. Here is a simple pictorial that shows uh, the results of a study here where you can see on the right side, uh, the patient has significant multi-vessel, multi-level disease with ABIs of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 and, and, and below. Uh, interestingly also, we have uh, uh, there was a mention that we also sometimes look at the waveform through the Doppler signal, which is shown there. A brief word about that. Normally blood flow is multiphasic. So initially there's a systolic flow there's deceleration and then diastolic flow reversal. So alterations in this are also helpful in our diagnosis paradigm. And that was just more for our medical professionals. So I apologize to get into the nitty gritty here. Um, as you may imagine, reduction of greater than 20 millimeters um, between segments or at the same level involving the opposite leg is significant, successive, Abnormal values can indicate multi-level disease. But like any other test, there are some caveats here. If the body develops collateral vessels along those blockages, or the patient has ex uh, increased gradients because of high blood pressure, or is not getting enough blood flow because of low cardiac output because of low function of the heart, then you know this, this test can be thrown off. And like anything else, as mentioned, when our suspicion is there, we may proceed to other testing modalities in conjunction with this to make the diagnosis. Again, if, if we do have that, we can use other things in certain conditions as diabetes or end-stage renal disease, you know, there may be difficulty in compression of the vessels, and then we have to choose other methods. I want to briefly mention exercise testing, because as if we go back and we say, hey, you know, we suspect this disease, there's mild, the ABI is normal, but the patient has true symptoms. This, this is another modality that where we use, utilize exercise to unmask significant disease. So basically we are performing this to reproduce symptoms, to determine severity, to also see what the patient does during exercise and post-exercise, and that has um, additional prognostic information, which we'll discuss. And also to rule, rule out pseudoclaudication, which is a condition that manifests as claudication, but is caused by other things, which include venous insufficiency, issues in the lower back, neurospinal, or musculoskeletal issues. And we can also use this to see how a disease has progressed or even the response to therapeutic measures that have been performed. Basically patients uh, exercise based on a protocol and, and that's when they can exercise. And so this test, as you could imagine, cannot be done with folks that have contraindications to exercising uh, on a treadmill. Normally, um, drops uh, in greater than 20% from baseline uh, are indicative uh, of significant disease and also recovery time. And that, as mentioned, becomes important. So the longer it takes to recover, the worse the level of disease is suspected. A brief word on a test called transcutaneous oxygen measurements. These can be used sometimes basically to check healing potential in the feet. So now that we know 
what peripheral arterial disease is, how it manifests throughout the body, its implications, and how we diagnose it. What do we do about it? So we're going to talk about some treatment options. I just want to take a minute and, and tell folks that the most important thing you can do if you suspect if you suspect yourself, a loved one, or anyone with peripheral arterial disease, is to form a great relationship with your care team. And that's going to be with your doctor because this is a progressive condition. This is a condition that's complicated and has various treatment modalities, as we'll talk about. And it, and it requires follow-up. So you want to be have a great relationship with your care team and, and really build that relationship because your partner's in this for life. So going to treatment options. So therapies that help uh, atherosclerosis are going to be mentioned here. And as you can imagine, this, this is a process that, as I mentioned, was progressive. So we want to continue to monitor, and these therapies may change based on the modality uh, as time goes on. So initially, we try medicines um, such as uh, aspirin or clopidogrel, which are antiplatelet agents, which uh, reduce the formation of blood clots around these plaques. And we also use statins, um, and particularly high-dose, high-intensity statins in the form of atorvastatin or rosuvastatin. And that, as you can imagine, lowers cholesterol. Uh, it also reduces inflammation. And as a result of that, they've been found to be helpful in this condition because atherosclerosis is the number one cause, as we had discussed earlier. There are now newer studies and newer therapies that are out that use low-dose anticoagulants in combination with these antiplatelet medicines uh, for reducing uh, events. As with anything, control the, control the problem. So we treat blood pressure, we stop the smoking, we coordinate diabetes management. In certain instances, when there's no contraindication, we use medicines such as celastazole, which may help improve walking distance. A key part of the treatment options for patients that have peripheral arterial disease is a supervised exercise regimen. So this can be done in a cardiac rehab facility, and it can be based on home-based exercise programs as well. And the goal is that from the time someone starts walking till the time they have symptoms where they must stop, our goal is to increase that time, the claudication time. So for example, if someone walks for, and it takes five minutes till they develop symptoms, they're gonna stop and then keep going each day that time period should extend. And the goal is to improve that and to improve the quality of life. In cases where symptoms are uh, life-threatening or threatening in terms of tissue loss, right? Critical limb ischemia, as we had mentioned, as well as our lifestyle limiting, uh, then we uh, pursue other strategies in addition to the medical therapies and the graded exercise regimen I just mentioned. And this is revascularization, and which this means is attempts at restoring blood flow. This is done in two separate ways. It can be done surgically, or it can be done through percutaneous uh, endovascular intervention. And that's, we'll, we'll, I'll show a diagram of both. It is important to note that neither of them should be performed to reduce the progression of disease. So someone that may have mild disease or is asymptomatic, these are not performed to reduce progression of disease as these two uh, can lead to have its own inherent complications and risks. When surgical intervention is performed, usually a vein is used, which I will also go into here. And when someone has critical limb ischemia, as we talked about, when the damage is there with the non-healing ulcers and the rest pain, et cetera, we really like to approach this disease as a team. As you know, there's multifacets to medicines, therapies, and, and various processes to really decide what needs to be done before um, someone will need an amputation per se. Folks with critical limb ischemia, as mentioned, um, do have a team-based approach uh, to, to their care. 
but folks that have acute limb ischemia, and that is when there's an acute blood clot that forms or there's uh, acute in, an emergency, it is an emergency. We don't wait. Those are the patients that call 911, go to the ER, and at that point, they try to do salvage the limb as best as possible. Throughout this, uh, this is a progressive disease, and as you can imagine, with treatment, there's going to be continued follow-up, and those are going to that's going to be follow-up of the risk factors, various symptomatology, the functional status, as well as ABI testing after revascularization has occurred. So an example of the endovascular treatment or percutaneous peripheral intervention is uh, it's minimally invasive and there is access to the artery at which point you can see here, there's narrowing and compromise of blood flow, which is then rectified with the use of a stent in this instance and inline blood flow is restored. So that is done through a minimally invasive access of the artery using stents and balloons, et cetera, over wires to, to perform this. When surgery is required, uh, essentially, when there's a long area of blockage here that is depicted between the femoral, ar femoral artery and the popliteal artery, a vein graft or a graft of other autologous material is used and sewn prior to the blockage and distal creating a conduit of blood flow and restoring that inline flow. Though we've talked about peripheral arterial disease and it's the mortality and morbidity associated with it, the silver lining really is, is that we can do a lot in our lives to reduce our chances of developing this condition. And those things are common sense, as I like to put it, and what I tell my patients and the way I try to live my life. And that is, you know, practicing things that promote a healthy lifestyle and really target those risk factors that combat atherosclerosis or target those risk factors that lead to atherosclerosis. Number one on the list is definite uh, avoidance of tobacco use and cigarette smoking maintaining a healthy weight, reducing obesity, as this affects cholesterol levels and has other implications as well. Eating a healthy diet, uh, fruits rich in fruits and vegetables, avoiding trans and saturated fats. We should exercise regularly, control risk factors such as blood pressure. Um, if we have diabetes, a coordinated approach to monitoring and controlling blood sugars and you know other medica and use of other medications such as statins um, and regulating cholesterol level, uh, really trying to get down based on what your risk factors on after discussion with your physician and healthcare team. So I hope today was informative and helpful for both uh, healthcare professionals as well as folks watching at home. Key takeaways of this talk um, that we that were important to get across is that peripheral arterial disease is an important cause of death and disablement worth worldwide. It is progressive and unfortunately, despite our best efforts, is increasing in prevalence across the world and in our communities. The signs and symptoms vary according to the vascular bed involved and the degree of blood flow that is impaired to those regions. When we suspect this, Diagnosis can be confirmed by simple, non-invasive testing that is both physiologic in nature and anatomic in nature. It is so important for us to forge great relationships uh, as healthcare professionals together and with our patients as we are a team uh, approaching to combat disease and treat this. This is a progressive process and continued follow-up is necessary. Prevention is the best cure, and in most instances, through healthy lifestyle choices, we really can make our difference in our lives and the lives of others uh, to reduce the prevalence of this disease. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Being Heart Month, uh, I hope this increases awareness about the condition. And for, for, for folks watching at home, we have so many resources that talk about other important topics during Heart Month, including patient stories, tips, um, and also just information about 
when we say healthy diet, what do we mean? Nutrition information and recipes, motivational tips, and healthy exercises you can perform at home. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for your time and attention. And I hope that uh, if you need us, we will be seeing you in the office. Thank you again.